Well, thank you, uh, Tanaka-san. Uh, we do indeed have uh, a history uh, together. In fact, uh, uh, his, in his kind introduction was, uh, I think, simply a uh, repayment for my kind in introduction of him at, uh, at, uh, at MIT uh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Chairman Hanyu for his, uh, his remarks uh, and for the hospitality of the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation for hosting this, uh, this event. I'll also uh, go back and with Mr. Tanaka and just uh, note that um, uh, it was a pleasure certainly uh, working with him uh, um, uh, at the IEA and, uh, and of course subsequently. And I just want to say that I think uh, he really uh, was a pioneer uh, in uh, bringing the focus of the IEA on climate change issues. And I think that's something that we appreciate very much and will be a, uh, a, a lasting contribution uh, to, uh, uh, to that. Um, the relationship uh, between our two countries uh, remains uh, one of the cornerstones for uh, peace and security uh, throughout the world. Uh, I think our countries have, uh, as you all know, forged a robust and unshakable partnership it embraces uh, trade and commerce, finance, security, science and technology, and energy. And together, I think we are and will tackle some of the major global challenges uh, in a world that is uh, changing uh, quite rapidly. Uh, President Obama uh, is very committed to the bilateral relationship uh, with Japan. Uh, he's been here twice. He's hosted uh, Prime Minister Abe at the White House in February. Uh, he's also uh, emphasized, uh, that is, President Obama has emphasized, uh, really increased emphasis in our foreign policy uh, to refocus priorities uh, in Asia, uh, even as we maintain commitments uh, in, uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, the President said, and I quote, the United States has been and always will be uh, a Pacific nation, and here we see uh, the future. So when we look at where uh, America's priorities uh, lie now and for years to come, it's clear that nowhere in the world uh, are there more critical opportunities to advance our economic interests, our security interests, and our enduring interest in promoting universal human values than in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Climate and energy uh, lie uh, at the heart of this focus. Both are key components of the U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship. Demand for energy has increased dramatically as Asian economies continue to grow creating many opportunities for economic cooperation and a clear need for smart growth. In Japan, especially following the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power station accident, energy security has taken on even greater uh, significance uh, here and uh, elsewhere. Now, turning to the climate challenge, uh, I want to say that uh, our view is that sir, we are past debating whether we need to respond, uh, uh, debate with Congress and, and, and internationally uh, is now much more focused on what is it we do, how much do we do, how fast do we do it. How fast we do it is a critical issue. Because of the cumulative effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, rem rem remembering that carbon dioxide has really centuries of residence time uh, in the atmosphere. Every ton of, of, of CO2 that we release counts against the emissions uh, for, our, for our generation and for the next generations. As the IPCC report recently stated, if one looks at what you might call the human emissions budget for carbon dioxide, to stay within the kinds of bounds we think are prudent, which is to have a high probability of no more than two degrees centigrade, uh, temp uh, centigrade temperature rise, we will run out of room for more emissions in about a quarter century if we keep uh, doing what we are doing uh, today. That's not a lot of time to change our energy system. And so, in fact, the time really is now uh, for all of us to work together uh, to change, uh, change these, the system. But I do want to emphasize that the risks of climate change certainly are, are tremendous for our children, our grandchildren, but we should also not overlook the fact that they are, there, there are risks uh, today as well. Two days ago was the first anniversary of Hurricane Sandy that hit the New Jersey, New York area of the United States uh, so hard. 
more than $60 billion of damage, uh, tremendous damage to our energy infrastructure, uh, a harsh lesson in how our infrastructures are interdependent, electricity infrastructure, information infrastructure, fuels delivery infrastructure, so that, frankly, even in a very advanced country, in a wealthy region of the country, weeks, literally weeks, of not being able to restore full energy services. Now, we cannot attribute you know, any individual storm specifically to climate change, but neither can we ignore that statistically we are seeing exactly the patterns of storm intensities, droughts, floods, wildfires that were predicted a quarter century ago. And so we do need to think that this is costing us today and not only uh, uh, creating major challenges for our uh, children and grandchildren. Japan itself has experienced uh, two major typhoons in the last three weeks. And we, again, we know that these types of extreme weather events are becoming more intense and more frequent. So in this context, I should also say that we certainly are increasingly viewing climate change as not only an environmental threat, but also a national security threat. For example, in parts of the world, particularly in uh, parts of the world where uh, perhaps societies are not well organized, uh, not well off economically, climate change, because of major environmental dislocations, can also be a huge threat multiplier in this world of global terrorism. So, climate, so addressing climate change, again, has enormous consequences uh, in, many, in many dimensions. So this kind of provides the backdrop for President Obama's climate action plan that he put forward in June. The plan has several elements, uh, and I want to emphasize three major points about it. The first point is that the action plan has three pillars. One pillar is mitigation, that is reducing greenhouse gas emissions so that we can in fact uh, avoid uh, in, uh, major increases in, in, in global temperature and major implications uh, of, uh, of, of climate change. This of course will, will bring us to the clean technology agenda to which I will return. But a second pillar uh, that the president emphasized is adaptation. That is, the president recognized that, as I said earlier, we are already experiencing the effects of global warming. We're going to experience more even as we mitigate, and we have to face this and start the process of adapting. For energy, what that really means is, and certainly in our case, that we will incorporate resilience to major disruptions as one of the key criteria as we develop the energy infrastructure of the 21st century. The third pillar is international cooperation, recognizing, of course, that, uh, that a solution to uh, climate change, to global warming, can only be one ultimately in which uh, all of us are doing our part uh, across, uh, across, across the globe. Uh, and this is a major focus uh, of, of, uh, of our trip this week in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, as we head to Warsaw uh, on the road to Paris in 2015, uh, it's really important that the United States and Japan stay aligned in our approach to international commitments. Our climate action plan uh, in the United States uh, gives us a, a strong platform. Uh, and of course, we understand that Japan and still needs to work through its energy policy uh, in this post-Fukushima period. We've heard that uh, already in the, uh, in the introductions. Uh, but again, uh, it's critical that uh, each of us uh, presents our, our commitments uh, and, uh, and again, stays well aligned uh, as, we, as we go forward. So the first point was the President had these three major pillars, including a new focus on adaptation. The second basic point concerns the question about whether the United States or other countries will in fact carry through the commitments that it announces. So this is where I want to stress 
uh, this may involve the niceties of our governance system, uh, that the President's plan, very extensive and very ambitious, is, however, based exclusively on actions that rely upon the authorities the administration already has. That is, it does not rely upon any further actions in the Congress. The conclusion of that is we will execute this plan. And I think that's very important, again, as we head on the road, particularly to Paris for the COP meeting at the end of 2015 uh, for international discussions, that we will be vigorously executing uh, our climate action plan. The, as, as an example uh, of that, that we are uh, uh, pursuing this, I would note that in the area of coal, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency has already put out, as promised, a draft rule that says that any new coal plant built in the United States already must have carbon capture and sequestration technology. The Clean Air Act, which provides the authorities uh, for such rulemaking, has always been there to push technology. So this, this rule pushed the technology, but then the Department of Energy responsibility is to push the technology forward and to lower the costs. And so on top of the $6 billion that we have already committed to carbon capture and sequestration technology, we have already committed an additional $8 billion of a loan guarantee program to stimulate the deployment of low emitting fossil technologies. So again, what I really wanted to emphasize is this is a plan that you should expect will be executed and that will have enormous implications for the United States, but I think it will have implications as well for all of our international relations uh, and provide a platform for uh, leadership uh, in the international climate change discussions. The third point that I want to make about the plan is that it reflects the President's all of the above energy strategy. So what does this mean? First of all, make no mistake, all parts of the plan are put in place in the context of moving to a low carbon economy. However, to do so, what we are committed to do, and the, United, and the Department of Energy has again a major role, in, especially in terms of technology uh, development and deployment, we will pursue the technology directions so that all our fuel sources can be competitive in a future low carbon marketplace. Whether it's coal, gas, nuclear, renewables, efficiency, we are aggressively pursuing uh, all of those directions. If I look at renewables, for example, today, uh, this is a case where I think many people have felt that renewable technologies are, are and always will be five or ten years away. We are saying we don't believe that's, that's correct. If one looks at the facts on the ground, the tremendous cost reductions in wind, onshore wind especially, photovoltaics, LED lighting, even vehicle electric batteries, what we are seeing is tremendous cost reduction, associated tremendous deployment increases, and we believe we are uh, right now uh, at the beginning of that true revolution of tremendous introduction uh, of these uh, of these technologies. As one example, uh, uh, or, or a couple of examples actually, in wind, in, in 2012 for example, wind was the largest electricity source de deployed in the United States, new source deployed in the United States. In just five years, photovoltaic panels uh, uh, have had deployment increased by a factor of 10, certainly in part because of a 75% decrease in the cost. Here in Japan, uh, we know the government has introduced very strong feed-in tariffs, uh, and this is certainly generating substantial investment in the renewable sector, uh, including from U.S. companies, uh, and power generation from solar PV 
therefore has increased dramatically uh, with almost four gigawatts of new capacity uh, installed in the first year of the program alone. Similarly, we see wind, uh, geothermal energy, uh, all coming forward uh, under the uh, umbrella uh, of these government policies to stimulate, uh, to stimulate renewables deployment. Electric vehicle technologies um, are also seeing remarkable breakthroughs. Now, clearly, uh, we have still small deployments here, but in the United States, in the first half uh, of 2013, there were more than 50,000 plug-in electric vehicles sold, again, more than twice uh, as the previous year. So this year, we will probably top 100,000 uh, uh, vehicles, and this rate of increase is actually higher than the comparable rate of increase for hybrid vehicles that we saw, say, 15 years ago. And of course here, uh, uh, Toyota, for example, has been a, a, a real pioneer uh, in, in hybrid vehicles. So we are seeing a very interesting mix of new vehicle technologies that include high efficiency uh, and electrification uh, at the same time. In the United States, I should add, in fact, that we have, again, I always talk in terms of three, apparently, we have a three-pronged strategy for uh, reducing oil use for purposes of both security and climate. So one is dramatically increased efficiency, and there the president uh, put forward efficiency standards that, roughly speaking, double the previous existing, the previous existing uh, requirements by 2025, and we are already seeing uh, the benefits of that, of that policy in terms of efficiency. The second uh, direction for reduced oil dependence is alternative fuels, and we are developing uh, and, again, having substantial cost reduction for next generation biofuels. And, of course, there's a lot of interest right now because of our abundance of natural gas uh, to looking at natural gas uh, as a uh, major transportation fuel. And third, what I already discussed, electrification. So again, we see a multi-pronged approach that is addressing security and environmental concerns uh, at the same time. On efficiency, again, we have a technology story, uh, LED lighting. The costs of LED lighting have dropped by about a factor of five in only a few years, once again leading to enormous deployment. In fact, today, well actually I'll say about a month ago, we released a report that showed this, that showed the drop of LED, of a single LED bulb from about $50 in the United States to about $15. Well, we can't keep up with the progress. Within two weeks, Walmart announced it would be selling some LEDs below $10, uh, dropping very, very, very rapidly. And the lifetime energy savings for U.S. energy costs, which are not the highest in the world, as you well know, uh, but even for the United States, the lifetime energy saving costs for that one LED light fixture is about $125. It's a pretty good deal uh, for the lifetime costs. Another area of efficiency is in the Climate Action Plan. Uh, we pledge to uh, dramatically accelerate the pace at which the Department of Energy issues rules, uh, increasing the efficiency standards of appliances uh, and, uh, and electronics. And in fact, we have done so. And as we look through 2030, we anticipate that the standards for appliances and electronics issued during uh, President Obama's first and second terms will cut, about, will cut almost two billion tons of carbon pollution and save enough electricity to power more than 85 million homes for two years. Now, Japan is also already, also already a world leader in energy savings and energy efficiency, uh, and this is again an area for great collaboration, uh, and I would just say that I think energy efficiency, demand-side management, is a, an essential item if we are to meet our carbon goals uh, going forward. Now again, Japan is and will be uh, an important partner 
uh, in promoting global climate change solutions, and we, 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 will, we, will, we will continue to work closely uh, uh, with Japan uh, and deepen our collaboration. The Clean Energy Policy Dialogue is one mechanism for that discussion, um, and it's a place for us to coordinate our clean energy policies and technical activities. Uh, through the Energy Policy Dialogue, uh, for example, we have coordinated activities in an Okinawa-Hawaii Clean Energy Partnership, focusing on island uh, uh, technology solutions. Uh, under the Tohoku Green Communities Partnerships, we've hosted government and business representatives from the Tohoku region at DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, as well as Greensburg, Kansas, a town that had been devastated by a tornado and re then rebuilt using clean energy and technologies with DOE support. So we hope that we have provided some ideas and images for revitalizing areas in Tohoku damaged by the, uh, by the great earthquake and, and, and tsunami uh, with, with clean energy. Microgrids, I already mentioned a little bit about that. U.S.-Japan collaboration uh, could stand as a model for other countries looking for climate resilient solutions. Microgrids, as I alluded to earlier, have the potential not only to promote the use of renewable energy sources, they can help communities recover from natural disasters uh, that are becoming more frequent uh, with uh, increasing global warming. The ability of microgrids to do this was demonstrated in Japan in March 2011 when a microgrid serving facilities at the Tohoku Fu uh, Fu Fukushi University in Sendai was able to continue supplying power and heat to customers while other power supplies in the region were disrupted by damage from, from the earthquake. So achieving greater resiliency of Japan's power grid is also one of the lessons learned from the March 2011 earthquake. In the United States, we have embarked on a major effort, as I noted earlier, to develop microgrid technology to provide the same kind of resilience. Fuel cells, another area where Japan is at the forefront uh, in developing hydrogen and fuel cell commercialization with major companies, including Panasonic and Toshiba, installing several thousand residential fuel cells operating on natural gas, and Toyota, Honda, and Nissan planning commercial fuel cell vehicles uh, in the next few years. DOE's Fuel Cell Technologies Office works closely with Japanese researchers and companies uh, in these areas, uh, including development of codes and standards. A prime example is the nearly decade-long support that DUE laboratories have provided on hydrogen technology applications to the Institute of Carbon Neutral Energy Research, a partnership between Kyushu University and the University of Illinois. Together, our researchers are accelerating development of fuel cell electric vehicles. So we really have tremendous collaboration and tremendous promise uh, in these areas uh, of, uh, of renewable technologies. Let me turn to fossil fuels. As you know, natural gas uh, burns cleaner than other fossil fuels, uh, releasing about half of the uh, CO2 compared to coal, for example. And the United States, uh, the abundance of shale gas has played a very important role in increasing our energy security, decreasing our energy imports, decreasing our CO2 emissions, and providing a bridge fuel to the clean energy technologies of tomorrow. Thanks to shale gas, the U.S. is again the largest gas producer in the world. And this revolution has come as the result of years of public-private partnership, starting with Dep Department of Energy research in the late 1970s, passing to demonstrations by private companies, uh, supported again in a public-private partnership, and now, of course, the deployment of these technologies uh, to extract shale gas from from rather deep uh, formations. As I already said, the all of the above strategy means that we will continue to emphasize clean fossil fuels in the President's Climate Action Plan. Now, we recognize, as, all, as was already stated, uh, Japan's interest in LNG exports from the United States, and uh, two projects with strong engagement uh, from Japanese uh, uh, customers, uh, the Freeport and, and Cove Point, uh, uh, applications have been conditionally approved. Another one, Cameron, uh, is uh, now second in our queue uh, for uh, uh, looking at licenses. I do want to, uh, I, th I think uh, we, we know that uh, uh, many in Japan are 
extremely happy with these, these developments, uh, looking forward to LNG uh, exports to, to Japan. I do just want to uh, provide a little caution in terms of time frame uh, in that uh, we provide the initial approval. This then goes to the Federal Regulatory Commission for Environmental Review, comes back to DOE. Uh, we are working as fast as we can, but there are several steps. Uh, but hopefully, uh, LNG exports will flow to Japan uh, within, within a few years. Another very important area is carbon capture. Uh, which I already alluded to, and Japan is also demonstrating the capability to capture car uh, carbon from thermal power generation and to sequester it below the seabed. Uh, this effort, effort, funded by METI and implemented by the Carbon Dioxide Capture and Sequestration Corporation, uh, is working on two projects uh, to store carbon below the seabed off the coast of Hokkaido. Another example of common interest where collaborations are possible because we are also very interested in looking now at these uh, offshore under seabed uh, opportunities for, uh, for sequestration. And in fact, uh, next week uh, we will host in Washington, D.C. The, at a ministerial level the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum uh, and this is certainly one of the areas that we will want to explore. Japan is also a leader. Uh, in methane hydrates research, again an area of common interest and collaboration. Uh, in the spring of this year, Japan succeeded in extracting gas from a meth methane hydrate deposit in the Pacific Ocean, offshore, in a first-of-a-kind operation. And we've also worked together in, 20, in 2012 in a test on Alaska's North Slope. So Japan has partnered uh, with the Department of Energy and Industry on methane hydrates research in the Gulf of Mexico for over a decade. Our continued collaboration is vital here. Methane hydrates represent research challenges, but a, but a very important resource potential. When, in my former life at MIT, um, uh, when we wrote on natural gas, we, we noted that methane hydrates could be the next big revolution uh, following shale gas, uh, although uh, it will take some time, certainly, to make this a commercially uh, viable activity. Let, let us now turn to nuclear energy, another part of the all, all of the above strategy. Uh, President Obama, uh, again, has made clear that secure nuclear power is part of our low carbon energy future. Today, it accounts for about 60% of electricity from low carbon sources in the United States. And while we had seen stagnation in new reactor construction in the US for many years, there are currently five nuclear reactors under construction including the first reactors to be licensed in the United States with new passively safe features, so-called Generation 3 technologies. And once again, I would note Department of Energy has been strongly, inv uh, strongly involved as we have uh, uh, roughly an $8 billion loan guarantee uh, uh, offered uh, to help with the construction of some of these new plants. Of course, Japan has been a world leader as well in the development of nuclear energy. Uh, and nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, uh, and our nuclear industries are, as is well known, closely uh, connected. Nevertheless, of course, we, we also understand and respect the complicated context of the nuclear energy discussion uh, in Japan following the Fukushima accident uh, and uh, are uh, prepared and willing, of course, to engage in all discussions uh, as we resolve this going forward. In the days and months uh, after the tragedy, uh, the American people, I think, stood firmly with the people of Japan. As President Obama said uh, at that time, and I quote, the Japanese people are not, not alone in this time of great trial and sorrow. Across the Pacific, they will find a hand of support extended from, from the United States as they get back on their feet. So from the beginning of the Fukushima accident, the United States worked to support the government of Japan uh, in the immediate response efforts and in recovery, in recovery and are prepared to do so as well in the cleanup and decommissioning activities that will still take quite some time uh, in the years ahead. The Department of Energy, within days of the accident, sent a team of 34 experts and more than 17,000 pounds of equipment in support of the efforts to manage the crisis. We deployed our aerial measuring system and consequence management response teams to assist the government of Japan with radiation measurements. And our environmental management team 
has leveraged and made available the experience and technology from the Department of Energy and our national laboratories to the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, for its decommissioning activities, including groundwater management and treatment and disposal of contaminated water. Our national laboratories have established a direct relationship with TEPCO to provide analysis and experts to support these efforts. We expect the relationship in the area of decommissioning between TEPCO and our national lab laboratories to expand and deepen in the coming years. Just as the tragic event had global consequences, the success of the cleanup also has global significance. So we all have a direct interest in seeing that the next steps are taken well uh, and, uh, and efficiently and safely. American companies have extensive experience in dealing with large complex cleanup and decommissioning projects, more than we like, in fact, uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, some of our companies have worked closely with TEPCO and Japanese business counterparts on Fukushima decommissioning activities since the days immediately following the accident in March 2011. And our decommissioning and decontamination industry, again, stands ready to support the Japanese government and TEPCO on decommissioning activities and contaminated water challenges should Japan need their help. As Japan continues to chart its sovereign path forward on the cleanup at Fukushima and works to determine the future of their energy economy, the United States is ready to assist our partners in this daunting task. In 2012, the United States and Japan created the Bilateral Commission on Civil Nuclear Energy to strengthen our strategic and practical engagement on Fukushima cleanup, emergency response, nuclear safety regulatory matters, civil nuclear R&D, and nuclear security and nonproliferation. In all these areas, it's critical that we achieve concrete results. We welcome the Japanese government's decision to increase its direct involvement in the cleanup efforts at Fukushima, Daiichi, and to reach out for assistance following the recent contaminated water incidents at the site. The International Research Institute for Decommissioning, IRID, on behalf of the Japanese government, recently published a request for information to solicit international technology, knowledge, and experience to help address the water challenges at Fukushima Daiichi. This is an excellent first step toward establishing international collaborations to support cleanup. Our DOE National Laboratory staff are supporting IRID's review of the information collected. We know that TEPCO and the Japanese government are facing significant challenges from contaminated water, uh, but we should not lose sight of the fact that TEPCO has continued to work on spent fuel removal activities while addressing these water challenges. I understand that TEPCO will begin to remove spent nuclear fuel from Unit 4 on schedule in mid-November. This will be a significant milestone for TEPCO and the Japanese government and a significant step in the process of decommissioning the site. With respect to nuclear safety and regulation, we would also like to commend the government of Japan for establishing the new Nuclear Regula Regulation Authority uh, in the wake of the Fukushima crisis. An independent and transparent regulatory authority is essential for ensuring the safety of any nuclear program. It's important for all of us to continually examine our national program so that regulatory independence is practiced and protected. As we have learned in the United States, integrating lessons learned into the overall regulatory approach is the next step in a steady process that will ensure the appropriate prioritization of actions and long-term sustainability. We've seen evidence of the NRA taking those lessons learned into consideration as it reviews Japanese applications for reactor restarts. In the United States, we experienced a Three Mile, three mile Island accident in 1979, and we learned a great deal from that experience. Those lessons have translated into high public confidence in nuclear power, and I believe that nuclear power can follow a similar trajectory in Japan. We cannot lose perspective of nuclear power as a clean, reliable source of baseload while recognizing that each nation will make its own choices on how to meet its low carbon obligations. As our president has repeatedly stressed, we need an all of the above strategy to maximize our use of all clean energy sources and reduce our carbon emissions. And the president, as I said earlier, definitely includes nuclear power 
as one of the one part of that all of the all of the above strategy. Let me turn briefly um, and uh, move to the end of my remarks uh, uh, on nonproliferation. Uh, Japan and the United States uh, 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 have a shared commitment to preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. From the foundations of the Nonproliferation Treaty, we've worked together to build an effective global nonproliferation regime uh, and to address challenges from North Korea, Iran, and others. While the Nuclear Security Summit framework launched by President Obama, uh, I mean, within that framework, we are collaborating closely to strengthen international standards, improve security of nuclear materials, and convert or dispose of nuclear materials that could pose a proliferation or terrorism risk. Just as, as Japan has led in the development of peaceful nuclear power, so too Japan is among the world's leaders against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The United States continues to believe the separation of plutonium needs to be in balance with a corresponding pathway for the eventual consumption or disposition of that material. And we, we realize uh, the challenges that Japan faces in this regard given the uncertain future of nuclear power. Nevertheless, we have welcomed Japan's longstanding support for this principle of balance between plutonium separation and consumption and emphasize the importance of developing plans that will remain consistent with this policy. Japan also has an opportunity to lead by ratifying the Convention on Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage, or CSC. Japan's ratification of the CSC will bring the convention into force and facilitate uh, U.S. commercial uh, participation uh, in Fukushima, Fukushima cleanup and decommissioning. Uh, and of course, it will uh, facilitate uh, our U.S. and Japanese activities in international nuclear commerce. It will also set, set a leadership example for other countries in the Asia Pacific region and around the world and reinforce the CSC as a global nuclear liability norm. I believe that, as in so many other areas, Japan and the U.S. are fundamentally aligned on, this issues, on these issues and will move forward together. So in concluding, I say again, the United States uh, is a Pacific nation with a long history and deep relationships with many countries in this region, most especially Japan. The U.S.-Japan partnership continues to grow and flourish to the benefit of both of our peoples. As partners, we can build on our strong relationship and shared interests in energy, environment, and security to create a better future for both countries. And we can always achieve more together than we can alone. We will find the best path forward through cooperation and dialogue, build on our strong relationship and shared interests in a diversity of energy technologies, as well as environment, safety, and security to create a low-carbon energy future. And together, we will seek to prevent the devastating effects of climate change. Our task is not simple, but it could not be more pressing and important. So thank you, and I'll be happy to hear your comments and respond to your questions. As a privilege of moderator, let me ask a couple of questions, uh, Ari, if you allow me. <laughs> um, I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your kindness. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Hanyu of Sasagawa Foundation asked the first question uh, as a technology for the nuclear power. In fact, uh, there are many people who are talking about nuclear's future without knowing the technologies in the reactors or fuel cycle, et cetera. And just safety, safety, safety is a preoccupation of the people. So I think it is not healthy in a way without knowing the technological uh, future of the nuclear. It is uh, rather difficult to discuss. And uh, I understand that, as you say, uh, the concern about technology in the safety side as well as uh, proliferation side, uh, resistant technology is uh, readily available. I understand that the uh, Department of Energy's Algon National Laboratory has uh, certainly uh, would say, spent quite a long time for uh, the new uh, technologies of reactors like uh, integral fast reactor or pyro processing. And Korea is now trying to do it there. 
And small modular reactor is certainly one of the promising future of the nuclear technology. So what, as a uh, nuclear uh, scientist uh, and a physicist, uh, what do you think about the US policy on the future of these uh, fuel cycle nuclear, advanced nuclear technologies? Because I fully understand that US has a luxury of shale revolution. You have plenty of oil and gas cheap. Why we bother about nuclear and just keep the spent fuel in a dry cask for 50 years, 60 years, and let's think about the technology in between. Unfortunately, Japan or Korea do not have that luxury. So as a technology leader, US, if you don't do that, somebody else may get into the, this new technology. I think US should show the clear leadership of the nuclear technology of the future. Otherwise, you may lose this uh, kind of uh, leadership role. What do you think? Uh, well, that's a fairly complex uh, um, <laughs> question. Uh, let me make a number of comments. Uh, first of all, as I said, uh, we are committed, the president is committed to this all of the above uh, strategy. And uh, the reason is not just because we want to you know, spread our uh, technology efforts over uh, uh, all options, but we believe that the solution uh, ultimately for the low carbon world uh, will not be the same technologies everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Different countries right. and different regions within our country mm -hmm. have very, very different conditions uh, and very, very different energy resources. Uh, so for example, uh, today uh, we have uh, four new nuclear power plants being built in Georgia and South Carolina in our southeast. Well, you know what? The Southeast is terrible, for example, for wind resources, mm -hmm. as one example. Now, in addition, there are regulatory structures uh, that are more favorable in that, in that case. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, concentrated solar thermal uh, is terrific for Arizona and parts of California. So we, we believe that, that the market will determine the mix of technologies, mm -hmm. and that market is not just some monolithic global market. It's very regionally structured, even within the United States. I see. So that's one point. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, in that uh, you, again, we all know, and we've said it many times today already, that we have an abundance of inexpensive natural gas. I will just note that uh, if I go back again to my previous life, um, and uh, at MIT, we produced this large study called The Future of Natural Gas. Uh, I think you've read it. Uh, yes. The, um, I might say that when we started the project, we asked the question, is natural gas part of the, solu part of the solution or part of the problem of, cli of addressing climate change? And after doing the study, we concluded that the answer was yes. Namely, as we start down the path to very low carbon, natural gas is part of the solution. Because, and we, we are seeing that in front of our eyes, actually as the, the markets have driven natural gas to substitute for coal and therefore decrease carbon emissions. In fact, I did not say this earlier, uh, I'll take the advantage of saying it now, that in 2009, uh, President Obama committed to a 17% reduction of carbon emissions uh, relative to the 2005 baseline to be accomplished by 2020. And today, from 2009 to 2013, uh, we are halfway to that goal. And half of that has come from natural gas substituting for coal. However, if we run the movie forward, you can pick your time frame, 20 years, et cetera. Assuming that we are, in fact, continuing to clamp down on carbon emissions, eventually natural gas without CCS will also be too carbon intensive. So we're going to need to make a transition to, zero, to, to really essentially zero carbon sources. 
that could be coal or natural gas with CCS. Nuclear, obviously, uh, is part of that, as are renewables. And of course, efficiency is always in the game. Mm -hmm. So we believe this is an essential part of the technology mix. Now, to enable that, uh, we have a number of uh, activities. I already mentioned uh, we are helping uh, through uh, at least the offer of a major loan guarantee to stimulate the construction of these generation three uh, nuclear power plants, uh, which have uh, new so-called passive safety features. That's one thing. But secondly, uh, we also have a very active program of financial assistance to bring at least two different small modular reactor designs to design certification by our regulator. The, these reactors show tremendous promise. They are much smaller in size, ranging, let's say, typically from 50 to 200 megawatts. Their much smaller size makes them much more flexible to introduce into electricity systems in, uh, in many different locations, in developed places like Japan and the United States, also in less developed countries where, where a 1,400 megawatt reactor might be difficult to accommodate. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we are moving that forward aggressively. Uh, but we also know, and oh, I should have said, and these, these reactors, because of their size, can bring in even more good safety and security features. Yeah. But there's one unanswered question. When we build them, what will actually be their cost per kilowatt? Yeah. And we're not going to know that if we don't build them. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are supporting uh, the licensing. This is almost a half a billion dollars we are providing uh, for Move That Forward. That's another example. Mm -hmm. A third element, and you alluded to it briefly, is what do we do with the spent fuel, yeah. nuclear waste management? Mm -hmm. And here, again, the administration uh, following the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, a group that was put together by the Department of Energy at President Obama's direction, chaired by two very distinguished public servants, uh, Lee Hamilton and Brent Scowcroft. I was a member of that commission, so of course I endorsed the recommendations. Uh, the uh, administration has put forward a, a plan uh, that would significantly change how we address nuclear waste management based upon those recommendations. We believe that's another part of getting the public confidence uh, in nuclear power, that the public can see that there is a, a clear pathway uh, to the uh, disposition. The barriers are not scientific, uh, but we need to exercise the process properly. And if there was one important recommendation of that report, at a very high level, it was that our development of waste disposal facilities must be based on the consent of communities and states. And that's how we will address this. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this uh, answer from Mali shows what a great person he is, knowledgeable about nuclear technology so much. And as a uh, Secretary of Energy, I hope that the uh, U.S. will lead, certainly, this future of nuclear technologies. Otherwise, simply safety discussion monopolize here and gives the future, uh, decide the future of the nuclear is not healthy. I mean, we need uh, nuclear power as a, uh, for, for, for people because that opened up a very important option for the developing economies, etc. So thank you very much for a very clear and very precise and detailed answer for that.